אנו מכריזים בזאת על הקמת מדינה יהודית בארץ ישראל. היא מדינת ישראל. I'd like to begin this lecture by picking up on the first of our five themes, identity. Mayor Shamgar, who was for 12 years the president of Israel's Supreme Court, once called the Declaration of Independence the birth certificate and the identity card of the state as a political, sovereign, and independent entity. Now, a birth certificate, quite obviously, but a birth certificate is put away in a drawer. Only rarely do you need it. In Israel, however, an identity card is something that you're always required to carry with you at all times. If the Declaration is Israel's identity card, then who issued it and to whom? Who actually declared the state? By what authority? In whose name? What is the identity of the entity being declared? It was a Jewish state in the land of Israel. But what did Jewish state mean to those who wrote the Declaration? And what do we learn about the identity of the new state from its name, Israel? And why was it ultimately preferred over other options? Now, if you ask most Israelis who declared the state, the answer they'll give is David Ben-Gurion. But the document itself says otherwise. And this is how it reads. We members of the People's Council, representatives of the Jewish community of Eretz Israel, and of the Zionist movement, hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel to be known as the State of Israel. Now, each bit of this sentence tells its own story. So let's unravel it. When that young 33-year-old lawyer, Mordechai Beham, gets the assignment to draft a Declaration of Independence, he pulls out the American Declaration of Independence and copies what seems to him to be the relevant parts. And among them was this passage. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress, assembled, and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare, etc., etc. Now, Beham simply copied this, and then he substituted. In his first draft, he wrote this. And by the way, he wrote it in English. We, the representatives of the Jewish people, do in the name and by the authority of the Jewish people solemnly publish and declare, etc., etc. So in this early draft, then, those declaring the state were representatives of the Jewish people as empowered by the Jewish people. Now, I think we'll all agree that's a rather large claim. Uh, remember that at the time, the Jews in the land of Israel numbered only about 600,000. Even after the Holocaust, there were still 11 million Jews in the world. How many of these millions were even Zionists? In either the United States or the Soviet Union, where most of them resided, is anyone's guess. And my guess would be a minority. No doubt this also occurred to subsequent drafters, because from one draft to the next, the declarers of independence and the authority of their mandate become progressively more focused. Now, I will simplify here, but this is that progression. And I should mention that it is explained in detail in another article by the indispensable Professor Shaha. Now, in Beham's own last draft, he split the Jewish people into two parts. We, the representatives of world Jewry in the diaspora and the Jewish community in Eretz Israel. Okay? Representatives of world Jewry in the diaspora, Jewish community in Eretz Israel. So now we have a bifurcated authority. World Jewry there and the Jews here. Notice, however, that world Jewry comes first. This was later modified to, in a subsequent draft, that reads, we, the representatives of the Zionist movement in the diaspora and the Jewish community in Palestine. So world Jewry has been replaced by the Zionist movement in the diaspora, which is something substantially smaller, but 
These are people genuinely invested in the project. And then came this refinement in the draft of May 9th. This is the work of Berenson. We, the People's Council, representatives of the Zionist movement and the Jewish community in Eretz Israel. So now we have an actual body right, with specific members, the People's Council, made up of representatives of the various political factions of the Yeshuv. And the Zionist movement is no longer described as in the diaspora, so that means it's here and there. In Shertok's last version, we see another change. The Jewish community in Eretz Israel, Hayeshuv Hayehudi, Hayeshuv Hayehudi, becomes the Hebrew community, Hayeshuv Hayivri. And this is how it will be referenced also in the final version. Although, as you've seen, in the official translation into English, Hayeshuv Hayivri is translated as the Jewish community. So when Ben Gurion makes his final edit, he tops things off by making one last change. He reverses the order. He puts the Yeshuv first and the Zionist movement second. Now let me repeat the final version for you. We, members of the People's Council, representatives of the Hebrew community of Eretz Yisrael, Nitzigei HaYeshuv HaIvri, and the Zionist movement, hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Yisrael to be known as the State of Israel. So the declaration has two sources of authority, the Yeshuv and the Zionist movement. And together, both of them constitute the authors of the declaration and the founders of the state. Now, where does this leave the Jewish people? It's the Jewish people that has the right to a state. The Yeshuv and the Zionist movement are the specific instruments of authority for claiming the right of the Jewish people as a whole. And in fact, the Declaration refers again and again to the rights of the Jewish people in such phrases as the right of the Jewish people to a national rebirth in its own country, the right of the Jewish people to rebuild its national home, the right of the Jewish people to establish their state, and most famously, the natural right of the Jewish people to be masters of their own fate, like all other nations in their own sovereign state. So the Zionist movement claimed that right for the Jewish people, and the Jewish Yeshuv, transformed by living in the land into the Hebrew Yeshuv, is the vanguard of the Jewish people. So the right to a state is the right of the entire Jewish people. It's natural right, affirms the Declaration. Jew doesn't need to be a Zionist. He may even be an anti-Zionist, but he still possesses his share of this natural right. It'll all be legally constituted in 1950 in Israel's Law of Return, which determines that, quote, every Jew has the right to come to this country as an ole. But while the Jewish people as a whole has the right to a state, only the Yeshuv and the Zionist movement have the authority to declare the state because they're comprised of people who've taken a voluntary act, join the Zionist movement or join the Hebrew Yeshuv or both. There are two ways to interpret how the authorship of the declaration uh, set the relationship among the Yeshuv, the Zionist movement, and the Jewish people. One is the model of a hierarchy. And Professor Shachar has said that the Declaration creates a hierarchy of Jewish parents and Jewish witnesses. I quote him, Zionists and Hebrews established the state and the rest of the Jews because they chose another identity only invited to stand on the sidelines. End of quote. Professor Shachar. Or perhaps it was even more hierarchical than that. The draft that came into Ben Gurion's hands for final revision included this passage. Listen carefully. We appeal to the Jewish people throughout the world to rally round the Jews of Eretz Israel and to volunteer to stand by them. Ben Gurion changed this by introducing two words, charged ones. 
Diaspora, and Aliyah. His version, and it's the final one, says, we appeal to the Jewish people throughout the diaspora, not throughout the world, but the diaspora, to rally around the Jews of Eretz Israel in the tasks of Aliyah and upbuilding. So this is pure Zionism in the Ben-Gurion tradition. You Jews elsewhere are living in the dispersion. It's your role to assist us in bringing you home. The writer and educator Asaf Inbari says that the Declaration brings us up against what he calls the fundamental source of tension for Zionism, which vacillates between the old Jew and the new Hebrew. So a confused definition of self is found behind the decisive we of those who hereby declare. I agree, Zionism may vacillate between the two, but the Declaration really doesn't. It's squarely in the corner of the new Hebrew. And by the way, this tension between Jewish and Hebrew is entirely lost in the English translations of the Declaration, which were made for foreign consumption. Um, this is also true of the official translation, which wasn't prepared until 1962. There, Hayeshuv Ha'ivri is simply translated as the Jewish community in Eretz Israel. No doubt the translators felt that Jewish here would resonate with the Jews of America emphasizing their shared solidarity, and that the use of Hebrew would have been bewildering. Uh, Jewish community was also the standard English usage in the mandate period, and departing from it in a translation would have raised eyebrows. To the English reader, then, it's all seamless. The Jewish people produces the Jewish yeshuv, which creates the Jewish state. In fact, the real progression is a series of revolutionary ruptures the Jewish people, produces the Hebrew yeshuv, which creates the Israeli state. In fact, all three of these elements are on display in the Declaration in precisely this order of progression. And here perhaps I'll pause to tell a story from the signing ceremony, which I think is relevant. Now, The actual signatories of the Declaration didn't look very much like new Hebrews, and quite a few of them looked like old Jews. Of the 37 signatories, 27 were born in Tsarist Russia, four in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, two in Germany, one in Romania, one in Denmark, and one in Yemen. Exactly one was native-born from Tiberias. Only nine of the 36 immigrants had come to the country before the First World War. The most veteran were Ben Gurion and Shirtok. The rest came during the British Mandate. One of them was Herzl Rosenblum, born in Lithuania, follower of the revisionist leader Vladimir Jabotinsky. After studies in Vienna, Rosenblum arrived in Mandate Palestine in 1935. He became a journalist, writing under the pseudonym of Herzl Vardi. So Vered is Rose, Rosenblum, hence Vardi. The People's Council, Rosenblum represented the small faction that had broken off from the revisionists. And this is how he told the story of his signing of the Declaration. When my name was called, I ascended the platform prepared to sign my name, which, as you know, is Dr. Herzl Rosenblum, the name I always use. Mr. Ben-Gurion turned to me and said in a preemptory tone, sign Vardi, not Rosenblum. Because of the excitement of the occasion, I, I couldn't grasp why I was asked to sign in this abbreviated way. Vardi was my nom de plume, my pen name. Ben-Gurion knew that, and thus knew to command me to write Vardi. Had I been in a more balanced frame of mind, I, I might have added Rosenblum in parentheses. But at that moment, I obeyed him unthinkingly. I did as he said and signed Herzl Vardi. And so it appears. And to this day, there are people who don't know who that Herzl Vardi is, whose name appears on the scroll of independence. A year later, I did officially change my name, but I don't use it. I leave that to my son. Sometimes afterwards, I encountered Ben-Gurion and asked him why he had requested that I sign as I did. His reply was that he wanted as many Hebrew names as possible to appear on the document. And Ben-Gurion, by the way, would be well known 
for insisting that civil servants and military officers Hebraicize their names. And Rosenblum, I might add, went on to become the editor-in-chief of Yidiot Achronot for 38 years and turned it into Israel's biggest selling daily newspaper. Now it's not just that the Yeshuv, that the Declaration privileges the Yeshuv over the diaspora. It privileges it over the Zionist movement on which for so long it was dependent and to which it was subordinate. Indeed, so fixed is the Declaration on the centrality of the Hebrew Yeshuv, a Yeshuv Avri, that its drafters almost failed to mention Theodore Herzl, under whose portrait the state would be declared. Uh, when the draft reached Tzvi Berenson, he noticed that while Balfour got a mention in the form of the Balfour Declaration, Herzl wasn't there at all. As Berenson put it, we were of the opinion that we had to add his name, especially after the mention of Balfour, who for all his importance was no more than a righteous Gentile. So that's how Herzl went in. But it isn't the world Zionist movement, but the Hebrew Yeshuv that the Declaration puts front and center. There's no mention of Zionist lobbying and diplomacy. The Stadlanut, which even then was in full swing to get Harry Truman to recognize the new state. Instead, we read that, quote, pioneers, defiant returnees, the Mapilim, and defenders made deserts bloom revived the Hebrew language, built villages and towns, and created a thriving community, controlling its own economy and culture, loving peace, but knowing how to defend itself. The Hebrew shoe, Yeshuv, could certainly take credit for these things, although it must be said that the Hebrew revival initially owed more to Odessa and Warsaw than to Tel Aviv. But the change Ben-Gurion made in putting the Yeshuv before the Zionist movement in the Declaration put their relative roles and contributions in a clear hierarchy. By setting up this juxtaposition of Hebrew and Jewish, as well as putting pioneering above lobbying, the Declaration of Independence declares the Jews of Eretz Yisrael to be independent also vis-a-vis -vis world Jewry and the Zionist movement. Until May 14th, the Yeshuv was in some sense an extension of both. Zionist Congresses had been convened in Europe, uh, and the Yeshuv had relied on influential Jews elsewhere to represent its interests in world capitals. With statehood and sovereignty, the balance of Jewish power was bound to shift, as it has ever since, toward Israel. Now, ironically, this formula of the juxtaposition um, immediately became redundant at the conclusion of the Declaration when HaYeshuv HaIvri was succeeded by Midinat Yisrael, right, the state of Israel. Uh, the climax of the reading by Ben Gurion came with these words, we hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Yisrael to be known as the state of Israel. This was the applause line, the culmination, and the naming of the state. Now, until this moment, very few people knew what the state would be named. In the various drafts of the Declaration, the space for the name was left blank. Uh, when the diplomats of the Jewish Agency in Washington were sent to secure an advanced promise of recognition for the state, they couldn't tell the Americans what the name would be. As Clark Clifford, who was Truman's legal advisor, later recalled, and I quote him, the name Israel was as yet unknown, and most of us assumed the new nation would be called Judea. Uh, the letter signed by Harry Truman on May 14th was typed as follows. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new Jewish state. Some hand crossed out the new Jewish state and wrote in its place the state of Israel later. So how was the name decided? By a vote of the People's Administration on May 12th. Uh, the protocol doesn't record the details of the debate. It simply records Ben-Gurion as saying, this was Ben-Gurion, we have decided that the name of the state will be Israel. And if we say state, then the state of Israel. To this can be added every word in the grammatical construct state. Army of Israel, community of Israel, people of Israel. So Ben-Gurion then put it to a vote. 
And according to the protocol, seven voted in favor. Opposing and abstaining votes weren't recorded. In his 1962 book, Three Days, the cabinet secretary, Zev Sharif, wrote that this decision was taken in the absence of any other suggestion. But we actually know rather more about the debate that preceded this meeting from two sources. The first, what Sharif told a journalist on the first anniversary of independence, and the second, a recollection of the chief opponent of the name Israel. This is what Sharif told that journalist in 1949. His name was Moshe Brilliant, and he published his piece on Israel's first anniversary in what was still called, even in 1949, the Palestine Post. And I quote him, most people had thought that the state would be called Judea, Yehuda, in Hebrew. But Judea is the historical name of the area around Jerusalem, which at that time seemed the area least likely to become part of the state. Also, it applied only to a very small territory, so Judea was ruled out. So, here I interject. From an its outset, Zionism had talked about creating a Jewish state, and so did the partition plan. As Jewish was a derivative of Judea, this name might have seemed a logical choice. But remember that according to the UN partition plan, virtually all the traditional geographic, geographic area of Judea was supposed to be either internationalized, right, that's Jerusalem and its environs, or part of the Arab state. So calling a state Judea that didn't include geographic Judea would have been an anomaly. But even if the state did wind up possessing a chunk of Judea, it would include much more than that. For example, it would include the Negev and the Galilee. And how could a state be called Judea when most of it was something else? It was problematic in another way. What would its citizens be called? Yehudim? How would that comport with the Arab citizens of the state, projected in the partition plan to number half a million? So Judea was ruled out. I return to the account of Sharaf via Moshe Brilliant. Zion was also suggested, but Zion is the name of a hill overlooking the old city of Jerusalem. So here again. We see the problem posed by actual geography. How could a state be called Zion when the geographic Zion wasn't going to be a part of it? Well, this would be, of course, a rather narrow interpretation of Zion, which even in the Bible is used as a term of reference for Jerusalem and even for the entire land of Israel. It was in that sense that it was adopted by the lovers of Zion in the 19th century and then by the Zionist movement. But the creation of a sovereign Jewish state had the effect of reducing Zion once again to its specific territorial meaning. And in any case, what would the name, what would the, na the citizens of this such a state be called? If he or she would be called a Zionist, it would create a confusion between someone living in America who supported the idea of a Jewish state and already called himself a Zionist and an actual citizen of the state. And, of course, to expect Arab citizens to call themselves Zionists would have been asking rather a lot. I return to Sharaf uh, via Brilliant. One man proposed Ever, the root of Ivri, which means Hebrew. No one liked it. Um, there's no explanation for why, and it's certainly connected to the idea of the new Jew as a Hebrew. Presumably, the citizen of such a state would have been called an Ivri, a Hebrew. But Ever also had a geographic association. It means crossing over. And one interpretation is that it refers to that which is west of the Jordan. That would be too limiting for some, and so no one liked it. I return to Sharif, again via Moshe Brilliant. Eretz Israel, the Hebrew biblical name for Palestine, was ruled out because of the dangers involved in its irredenta flavor. What does that mean? Well, aside from the association of Eretz Israel with the biblical past, uh, under the British mandate, it had been the official Hebrew name of the entire country. That name was Palestina Aleph Yud, for Eretz Israel. 
And Jews under the mandate did sometimes call themselves Eretz Yisraelim. But remember, the UN had called for a partition of the country. And while we shall see that the declaration was careful not to call the plan a partition plan, no one wanted to openly defy the UN either. So calling the state Eretz Yisrael would have sounded like an overt claim to all, all of mandatory Palestine. So it was ruled out also. Back to Sharaf. Via Brilliant. It was Mr. Ben-Gurion who first suggested Israel. It seemed strange at the beginning, and the proposal was received coolly. But members tried pronouncing Israel government, Israel army, Israel citizen, Israel consul, to see how it sounded. Most were unenthusiastic. But there were only 48 hours left, and much urgent work to be done, and the matter was put to a vote. Seven of the ten members present voted for Israel. So there you have it. The name Israel came to the state by a process of elimination because there wasn't time to come up with anything better. A majority voted for it unenthusiastically. The most cogent argument against the choice came from Yitzhak Grinbaum, the uh, foremost secular leader of interwar Polish Jewry, subsequent chairman of the Jewish Agency Rescue Committee during the Holocaust, and the first minister of interior of the state of Israel. Grunbaum made the argument for the name Judea and against Israel. And years later, he explained his rationale in these words. I oppose the name Israel. It reminded me of the name Israelit in French, used by non-Jewish sympathizers and assimilationists instead of Juif, which was considered derogatory. We Zionists embrace the derogatory Jew, which was the name of our people from the return from Babylonian exile and the building of the Second Temple. The independent Hasmonean state, also after the Roman conquest, had this name. I favored the revival of this name, which the masses of the Jewish people accepted in their spoken languages. Another name was liable to divide the state from the diaspora. Now for Greenbaum, the name Judea had the advantage of creating continuity. From the last expression of Jewish sovereignty, Judea under the Hasmoneans, and through the 2,000 years of the dispersion of the Jews. This had been embraced by the Zionists when they campaigned for a Jewish national home and a Jewish state. A state called Judea would emphasize not only the continuity in time, but would link the new state to Jews everywhere in the present. Well, it's an argument that Grunbaum lost because of the geographic counterpoint, which I mentioned earlier. Judean geography wouldn't have been part of the state, and it was too small. Grunbaum admitted, as he said, that the majority accepted Ben-Gurion's proposal because the borders of our state are wider than those of the Hasmoneans. But then we come to uh, Grunbaum's insinuation as to the real reason Ben-Gurion had come to prefer Israel over Judea, and it wasn't the geography. And I quote him, I had a feeling that Ben-Gurion didn't reveal the real reason behind his proposal, which was adopted. Unfortunately, it was realized after a few years that the name Israel created a misunderstanding among native-born Sabras. The Sabra began to see himself as an Israeli and not as a Jew." End of quote. In other words, Grunbaum suspected that the real reason Ben-Gurion preferred the state of Israel over the state of Judea was the same reason Shertok preferred the Hebrew Yeshuv over the Jewish Yeshuv. He wanted a rupture of continuity, a rupture with the Jewish exilic past. And Ben-Gurion didn't want a bridge to the diaspora, but its subordination to an eventual absorption into the new state. By the choice of the name Israel, then, Ben-Gurion was out to create a new identity, building upon yet superseding Jewish identity. I might just add in parenthetically that Yitzchak Grunbaum wasn't a religious man. To the contrary, he was a declared secularist and ended up in the socialist Mapam party. He didn't want the name Judea to tie the state to religion, but he wanted it to tie the state to Jewish history and not just Israelite antiquity. When Grunbaum complained that the Sabra had ceased to see himself as a Jew, he was speaking in 1961 at the very height of this 
secular wave of smug self-regard of the native-born Israelis, as though they had transcended Jewish history. How far from that are we today when it's American Jews who believe they've transcended Jewish history and complain that Israel's Jews are becoming too Jewish? Now, I've, I've turned over a lot of rocks in this lecture, and I can't do justice to all of the complicated issues of identity raised by the Declaration of Independence. The point is that while the Declaration raised them, it didn't fully address them. In particular, it left unresolved the question of just what precisely made the State of Israel Jewish. It posed the question, but it couldn't impose the answer. I began by quoting Mayor Shamgar, the Israeli Supreme Court Justice, who described the Declaration as Israel's identity card. But of course, it's impossible to reduce the identity of even a single individual to a card, and certainly not for a state as diverse as Israel. We'll see this question posed again when we come to religion in the Declaration. Let me end this lecture with a story. Earlier I said that the Declaration makes no acknowledgement of Zionist Stadlanut, the lobbying, that secured such international licenses as the Balfour Declaration, the League of Nations Mandate, the UN Partition Plan. Certainly the greatest of these lobbyists was Chaim Weizmann who'd played a crucial, if not decisive, role in securing all three. Now, by 1948, he was already old and ill, yet he still went off to America to put his prestige to work on securing the support of Harry Truman at the last minute. After the declaration in Tel Aviv, the bellboy at the Waldorf Astoria gave Weizmann a cable from the new provisional government, it was signed by Ben-Gurion, Shertok, Golda Meir, among others. Of all those living, said the cable, no one contributed as much as you to the creation of the state. And Weizmann, a few days later, would be elected president of Israel. Yet Ben-Gurion didn't leave a space for Weizmann to sign the Declaration of Independence. Technically speaking, Weizmann wasn't a member of the People's Council, all of whom did sign. Yet the fact that Weizmann wasn't invited to sign the Declaration aided him. Now Norman Rose, one of Weizmann's biographers, has reconstructed what he believed went through Weizmann's mind. Was he, Weizmann, not the most eminent of those who had struggled for Israel's independence? Running his finger down the list of names, he stumbled on non-entities, mere party hacks, raised to such heights only through political wire-pulling. He heard the lawyers and ped pedants arguing that he was ineligible for inclusion among the chosen but only pettifogging quill pushers whose minds did not extend beyond their legal jargon would accept this as sufficient cause for his exclusion. Surely these legal niceties were as nothing when thrown into the balance against his record. Was this not then a deliberate slight to his person? Weizmann's suspicious nature would not exclude such an explanation. Mayor Wiesgal, who was Weizmann's Man Friday, echoed the complaint in his own memoirs. Technically, he admitted Weizmann wasn't a member of the group entitled to sign. Yet Wiesgal insisted that the declaration, as he put it, was not a technical document. Every name affixed to it was an everlasting honor for the generations to come. Its text and signatories would be reproduced thousands of times over in history books and first grade primers. Moreover, 12, I repeat, 12 of the signatories of the Declaration of Independence were not in Tel Aviv when it was signed. Ten of them were in Jerusalem. Two of them were as far abroad as Weizmann in New York. Yet place was left for their signatures. Could not the same consideration have been extended to Weizmann? Apparently not. So the question remains, was there design? I have an opinion, but not an answer. There was a long-range view of history behind this technical omission. Now, Weizmann often complained about his exclusion. Wiesgal said that it wounded him deeply. But he was too proud to ask Ben-Gurion or the cabinet for its rectification, or to allow any of his friends to ask for him. Wiesgal said that Weizmann compared himself to a shadchan, a traditional marriage broker, who'd run you know, back and forth trying to arrange a marriage. Having succeeded, he asked for no fee, just the honor of saying one of the seven blessings over the couple. But then the couple eloped. 
1957, five years after Weizmann's death, Wiesgall tried to get Ben-Gurion to have Weizmann's signature copied onto the declaration. Ben-Gurion's reply, Weizmann doesn't need it. I think Wiesgall was right when he wrote that the long-range view of history was behind the omission, but not in the way he thought. He implied that Ben-Gurion was out to hoard all of the credit for the state's establishment and write Weizmann out of the story. But there may, be some, and there may be something to that. But the logic for Weizmann exclusion may be found in the document itself. As we've seen, the drafters only barely managed to squeeze Herzl himself towards the end of the drafting into the Declaration. The Declaration glorified the Hebrew pioneer at the expense of the Zionist diplomat and demoted the Zionist movement from the progenitor of the state to its subordinate. Weizmann's role had been to persuade the likes of Balfour and Lloyd George to issue favorable declarations and uphold them. But the meaning of independence was that Israel henceforth would issue its own declarations and uphold them. None of the signatories on that day had contributed as much and for so long as Weizmann. But their contributions lay ahead of them. And while some of the 37 signatories remained obscure, two aside from Ben-Goyon became prime ministers, one became president, 16 served as government ministers, and 25 were elected members of Knesset. So the declaration of the state thus also declared the end of classic political Zionism in the tradition of Herzl and Weizmann. But as we shall see next, turning the page on religion would be a more difficult proposition. I deliberately began with the exile. I thought, I can't include everything going back to Abraham. I imagine that educated people know these things. No one denies that the people of Israel inhabited the country and gave the world the Tanakh. The dispute begins with the return of the people to the land. 